back in July, I created a Tornado Effects demo application called the GitHub Browser. And uh, this one was uh, written using Tornado Effects 152 and Kotlin 103. So let me first fire up this application so you can see how it looked. You can log into any GitHub account and you can see a list of the repositories. And uh, you can choose the repository and then uh, you can browse the issues. And uh, most of this other stuff is just here for placeholder functionality. It was never my intention to create a, a full GitHub browser, but uh, I just wanted to showcase the syntax of Tornado FX and how you can do stuff with it. So what I would like to show you today is how we can evolve the syntax we used from 152 and the, the best practices from 152 into the best practices of 159. And uh, nowadays we're running against uh, Kotlin 105-2. And uh, Tornado FX 159 was released uh, just the other day, actually, uh, right before Christmas. So after we change the version, we will actually have some uh, uh, compilation is issues because we made a, a couple, not many, but some breaking changes. And they, uh, in this application, it will have to do with the replace view functionality. So the replace view will take, uh, you know, it will say that I would like to uh, replace the current view with a view and you give the class of that view and then you can give a, a transition and uh, it used to be just some hard-coded transitions pointing to a, a, a function uh, and uh, now we have uh, uh, made some changes to how this works and we made a lot better um, interface to to make your own transitions so we had to change uh, the syntax slightly. So we will instantiate uh, this uh, slide transition and we'll give it a, a parameter of uh, 0.3 seconds to tell it that we want it to, to last for 0.3 seconds. So this thing is used in three different places in this application. So I'm just going to real quick change those. Now I suspect the application will compile. Yes, it does. We have some deprecated uh, syntax as well. We'll look into that. Um, so we're done with the changes to uh, the palm. So we can close this one. And let's have a look at the login screen. A new um, feature now is that you can give the title to the view directly in the constructor of the view. So we can move this up into here and remove the title parameter. Also now we have a much nicer syntax for how to start your root node. You can start the root node directly as a builder. So instead of instantiating a VBox here, adding a class to it or whatever, and then in the init block, do the with root and then continue to build the, the UI, we can do some, something much more streamlined now. So let's start with a builder directly, do the add class and then move everything from with root into this builder. Then we can remove the init and with roots. And it, it just makes your uh, UI code much more coherent. We will make some other changes to this one in a bit. Let's just walk through a couple of other slides to see. Yeah, we have the same thing here, you see. And also we can change the builder here. Just let's do it one more time so you can, you can see how this works. So we start a border pane builder. We move all the code from the init block into the border pane builder instead and remove the init block. So again, it just makes it look a lot nicer. User screen is probably the same thing, but we're just gonna leave that because you get the point by now. So the next thing I wanna talk about is how we did the models back in the day. So you see, we use a, a user model here. Let's have a quick look at the user model. Uh, the user model uh, is a view model and we manually added this source object in here uh, and then uh, the bind, um, the, the bind um, functions were using the, this source object. So we had to initialize this view model with a user, but uh, in many cases, you won't have a user at once. So this kind of makes it awkward. So what we can do now is remove this source object and extend from item view model instead. We have to give it a type of user. 
now we have a property called item. But this item can now be null actually because we can instantiate an item view model without an actual user inside it. So we would uh, like to use the null safe um, syntax here. And uh, what this will do is uh, it will still give you a property to, to bind to in the model, even though uh, the item view model is not backing any specific item at the, at the, at the moment. So let's update the, the rest. Of the binding expressions that's it this will help a lot uh, and we'll see how in a bit <clears throat> so we got our user and we got the user model now this plugin can actually generate this item view model for you uh, but i wanted to evolve it uh, manually so you you see how we do it these days okay so the uh, user model is evolved we can do something else. You see here, we actually in, uh, instantiate the user model, uh, but we don't need to anymore. We can we can rename this model to, let's call it uh, current user, for example. And we can say it's a user model, but we can now inject it. So anywhere we inject this user model, uh, we will get the same instance. That's kind of how we want to use this uh, current user uh, in this application, at least. So this helps. Let's see what we use GitHub for in here. So yeah, we call login. So that should be fine. This change we will have to do in several places. <clears throat> so we can actually look for where we instantiate user model. Uh -huh. So in the controller we have the same thing selected user as probably what I should have called it here so well it, it actually current user is better so we can uh, rename this first to current user we will say it's a user model by inject it will be a val and uh, we will update the repo model as well. So we'll do the same thing here as we did earlier. Item view model type repo, remove our manual source property, change source to item. Go back to the GitHub example and inject this instead as well. So here we do some something we, we're not going to do anymore at all. We had functions in the controller that uh, made the, the, um, the models rebind to the, the, this new repo that was selected. We don't have to do that at all anymore. So we'll just remove this and uh, we we'll use some built-in functionality to do this instead. Let's see. So I think this is good. We have a... Uh, a select user function when we log in we used to call the select user function that we created but now we will just say current user item is the result of this uh, uh, api call this rest call to model to convert it into a user so what we do here is uh, we we call the rest endpoint we call the get entry point after we set some basic authentication and then the result if we ask for one that means we get a JSON uh, object and two model will com convert it into the type of model object that we give it um, you know the, the type parameter so uh, here it would say user but we don't need to do that since uh, Kotlin understands that the item is a type user so it will do the cast for us we don't need to specifically say that it's a uh, um, a user. So this looks a lot cleaner. Uh, let's see where else we probably did. Let's see where we instantiated repo model. So this was this was it and user model. Let's see. Should have some. Uh, Well, we took care of all the places we used it, so okay. Let's see if the application still runs then. Now we might run into another issue. Uh, and that is after you 
upgrade or change version for uh, of tornado effects you might want to build and rebuild the whole project because even though we're mostly source compatible we're not always binary compatible uh, we have one more thing we need to fix this edit repo function in the user screen you see when when we click the name of the user we call edit repo and uh, what that is uh, does is uh, uh, <coughs> set the selected repo but now we have a, a much nicer way of doing this so we can now uh, uh, inject the um, current repo in here which is a repo model by inject like we did earlier let's go back down to oh sorry current repo here so now we can just say that the current repo item is repo so when we assign to the item the rebind of the model is also done for us automatically okay uh, here we do something we don't need to do anymore we access the user by uh, getting it from the github controller and uh, this we don't need to do anymore at all and I suspect that's why we inject github here too the controller is injected to get this current user so we probably don't need this and the user can also be uh, a user model by inject instead So let's see yeah we we actually need the controller still but not to to access the <coughs> the user okay now we've uh, injected the models everywhere and we didn't need to call those pesky uh, select or set current functions in the controller anymore let's see if we compile now <coughs> seems to be compiling we can also run run it real fast to see that it's still working. Seems to be up and running still. Yeah, everything is still good. So we have one more thing I would like to to uh, show you. In this uh, application, I leveraged uh, the JavaFX event system, uh, and even though it works, it's a nice way to send uh, signals. Uh, it's a bit cumbersome to create events. You see here we have to subtype event and we have to uh, um, create some event types uh, for our event. Everything you know, everything I really wanted to, to have is a signal called issue tab activated. So I wanted to send a signal whenever the issue tab was activated. So in in Tornado FX 159 we have a uh, uh, an FX event class we can use instead and we can fire our own events uh, in the new event bus instead so uh, this this whole thing will now look like issue tab activated it will extend FX event and that will be it so let's remove all this other code that's the event now of course we will have some breaking changes so let's see how we we used the primary stage to fire an event earlier and now we can just use the built-in fire and uh, issue tab activated uh, this event is just a signal it doesn't com contain any data so actually instead of it being an, a class it might as well just be an object and uh, when it's an object you don't need to instantiate it so it, it makes it just look nicer when you fire the event and we also fire this event down here and uh, here we added an event filter to the primary stage to listen for this event and now instead of all this we can just subscribe to this event we created so issue tab activated and we do the same thing it looks a lot cleaner and uh, we didn't have to extend uh, the JavaFX event which is a bit uh, you know wordy so we have uh, one more issue to deal with expect to the top level declaration let's see what did I do I have one curly too many actually now uh, yeah I messed up here 
So this should happen when the event fires. So we say we subscribe to this event. When the event fires, we want to do this thing. So what we do when, when the event is fired, which will happen when we activate the tab, is uh, that we will run async with progress. That means run asynchronously, but also uh, show a progress uh, indicator inside the node that we're in. So we list the issues for uh, uh, this, uh, the current repo, and then we assign two items. And items, this is, a, this is a list view, so that will be the items of the list view. Let's see if it works with a new event system. So let's select this one. And now when I click here, we activate the issues tab and the, the event is fired. You can see it worked just like before, but with a lot less code and a lot cleaner code. So that was it. That's uh, the things I wanted to show you which are the most valuable syntax changes we've made this uh, last six months. So I hope you enjoyed it and that you would like to upgrade your own applications to this new syntax. Merry Christmas.